destroying, menacing and fast. If it's not menacing, he didn't have to pay attention to it. But if I put a gun in his head, he got to pay attention to it. Whether it be physical, moral, or mental. Now, when I'm talking about menacing, not to just kill him, as long as you can threaten something that's of value to him. It's of value to him. It all has to be bad. But his position of pecking order, respect from his peers, or his life, whatever it may be, as long as it's value to him, he's got to play the game. That's the situation. Menacing, both menacing and passive. So basically, if you look at this double dash system, after the double dash, what am I really saying here? In some sense, what you're really trying to do is generate a mismatch between that which he perceives and that which he must react or adapt to. So therefore, if I can work my way through the loop faster than he can or get inside his loop, then we generate those mismatches. I'm going to give you a feel. Let me illustrate. You feel very important for me. Let's assume we in this room are going to go up and get some magic or some other group of steps, which you people will eventually be doing here. Later. Okay, now let's assume, for the sake of the academic argument, that we can operate that fast with tempo or pace. In other words, we can get inside his loop. We, in fact, we call it OODA, O-O-D-A, OODA. You'll hear that term, O-O-D-A, OODA. So let's assume we can get inside his loop. What does that mean? If he goes to make a move, we adjust inside that move, so his move now is no longer relevant. If he tries to remove, we adjust again, it's no longer relevant. Well, after you know, after a couple of those, he's going to notice he's losing out. In other words, he's going further and further away from his goal. We're also going to notice we're going further and further closer to our goal. Well, if this is a competitive situation, he values what's going on. What's that going to do to him? Doubt and certainty is going to begin to build up in his mind. And if we keep that pace on and don't take the pressure off, we can transform that doubt and certainty into confusion and disorder. You've probably seen where people. When they're over pressure, they're coming out blue, they do strange and bizarre things. It makes it even worse unless somebody takes a squeeze off. Now, if you have one group going against another group, and a group, that other group's losing out, whatever it may be, then they start transmitting those doubts, fears, and uncertainties one to the other. So not only confusion and disorder, but panic and chaos come out. You can just see it well up. They come panic, they're totally unmoved. Can't function in an organic hole. Not only that, they start pointing fingers at one another because nobody wants to be a failure. That even helps even more. You've never seen that before, have you? Of course you. You've heard the statement. Victory has a thousand fathers, the king is north. That's what we're talking about. Nobody wants to take the point. So again, groups going against one of those doubts and fears begin to well up and transform the panic chaos. I'll show you. So it's a very important idea. Trying to get inside his system. The idea being when you get inside is to generate mismatches between that which he must, what he perceives, that which he must. Yeah. Okay. So we have an example. It turns out I'll show you three here. And the one, the first one that came to my mind that threw me in a historical investigation was the Bliss Creek versus the Magic Line in Dallas in The very first book I picked up. Everybody's talking about the very fast tempo, very fast pace the Germans are going to French with the people pretty some confusion, disorder, panic, chaos, and I said that's very impressive. And while I know that happened, because there were so many accounts that depicted that, what I didn't know, what were the internal dynamics associated with what's created permitted to do that? One thing to know the result, you really ought to understand the dynamic. Because if you understand the dynamics, maybe you can do it to somebody else. Or make it very difficult for somebody else to do it to you. Once again, not just in a physical sense, but also a moral mental sense. It would be important to understand that. Again, I'm not going to bring it out here because that's why I went to my historical investigation. Okay, but we'll, when we go into that, we'll show you what happened in terms of those post creek dynamics and why they're able to get their leverage over their atmosphere if they can't cope with it. Now, here's one I am very familiar with the 86 versus the MiG 15. <laughs> now, typically today, many people, or until very recently, people thought the MiG-15 was a more maneuverable airplane than the 86. That was a general contention. That was a general projection. Well, I will dispel that. I'll show you why. I make it very compelling and convincing. For one thing, we have a new frame of reference to which we can compare those airplanes. We have the UDU, observe or emphasize that. We'll use that frame of reference. We'll put them juxtaposed one against the other and see what happens. So let's take the first O, observation. 
86 versus the MiG-15. The MiG-15 was slightly smaller than the 86. So from the size viewpoint, it would have an observation advantage over the 86. Might be insignificant, but it's still there. On the other hand, the 86 had what we call a super bubble canopy, the MiG did not. Did not. So in terms of the ability to see out 86 was much better, and the pilots that flew both airplanes commented upon the fact it was easier for an 86 pilot to see a MiG-15 than the other way around. In other words, the ability to see out more than washed away the small size of this So from an observation viewpoint, 86 had the advantage over the MiG-15. Okay, orientation and decision, I'll keep together. That not only depends upon observation, but it also depends upon your previous experience in training. If that's pretty bad, then your orientation could be screwed up too. You're going to make inappropriate decisions, so even your actions can be caught. Well, we generally quoted our pilots, at least as a corporate group, were better trained and more experienced in combat. Now let's go to the action where this thing really comes out and tends to show the MiG might be better than 86. If you were to compare the MiG versus 86, you would find out <coughs> the MiG 15 could outclimb and outaccelerate the 86 throughout the entire flight off. In some parts, by very significant amount. Out climb and out accelerate the F 86. In terms of the ability to sustain a turn, the MiG was also superior to the 86 throughout the entire flight off. In terms of the ability to go what we call instantaneous, rough the pitch up or stall in an airplane, there are some areas 86 is better to make and vice versa. And then if you were to sort of integrate pull all that together, you'd say, well, on that basis there, ergo, the MiG 15 is superior to the 86. And on that basis, it's not a bad conclusion. Unfortunately, some things were left out. It turns out the 86 had what we call a super hydraulic flight control system for that time. High power hydraulic flight control. It's like you have power steering in the car. 2,800 pounds per square inch. So you could just move the stick from one way to the other and make the airplane pop very quickly from one direction to the other and pull back. The MiG did not. The point was when an 86 got bounced by a MiG, it would lag a little bit. It could Flip flop was turned quick the other direction, they took a long while. He took the flip flop was direction again, so it do a very quick scissor maneuver and just stuck the MIG out front, even though the MIG, for one particular maneuver, could stay behind 86. And 86 could transition or shift from one maneuver more rapidly than 86, I mean, than the MIG. And so by going these very quick reversals, the MIG couldn't do it. It just stuck in the floor. Because remember, you have to overcome those air loads. The faster you go, the more the air load, the more muscle power you have to use. Well, you have to put a substitute. That's called hydraulic power. It's like power steering in a car. Make this happen. So are we going to say then the ability to roll or pitch or roll pitch combination isn't a part of maneuverability? Well, that's absurd. It certainly is. Well, if that's a part of maneuverability, then how can you say to make it out of the 86? Yeah. 86 is one. When you look at it, it's broader sense. Because it can shift. If you go, they slip into one or another, more readily to make. And the pilots, they notice certain things would happen when they begin to get leverage over another pilot. His maneuvers tend to get disjointed, bizarre. In fact, they commented upon that. It seemed like their minds were coming up blue because they get inside their mind. They get inside their mind in terms of fear, doubt, and so you guys are going to die. They, people normally don't take that comment. <laughs> <laughs> And we're all wrong. In fact, you can go back to World War II. There's an account by Don Ginto. He's a P-51 pilot. You might have heard about it. World War II, P-51 over in Europe. He commented upon a couple instances in his life when he's fighting a couple Germans once after he had either ME-109 or the Fox World War IX. But he commented upon the fact that he, his fights start out, they're pretty equal. He began to get leverage. The other guy literally became disjointed. One guy literally flew into the ground. Literally just flew right into the ground. And the other guy came really came shot the ground. And he made a point, he said, you almost could see their mind just coming up blue. Because he's referring back one day, he wasn't doing so well, and all that well, starts welling up in him, and he probably had a hard time staying on top of the situation. We're all wrong. Think about your own life. At time. Think back at times when you have certain things you want to do, you have time pressure, and it's sort of not sure you're going to make it, and then somebody loads something else on before you start getting very nervous. First thing, you're trying to relieve that pressure so you can get this done and that done. But if you won't relieve it, it bothers you. Particularly if it's a bad Remember, once it's a bad, it's no bad. You know, but if it's one of bad, you can be that problem. That's the medicine. So that happens. We've seen. 
Okay. In the Israeli raid. We're talking about the Israeli raid. I mean, he's already said another example. In about 90 minutes, right? They are men of the truth. They're the team that we're The result is to go the other team. Can you think of any other than the way not really right now? In any case, if we stitch all that together, we come up with a new conception. Really, it's been there all the time. Just somehow didn't see a concept. You want to exploit your operations with weapons such that you deliberately generate a rapidly changing environment in terms of quick, clear observations, orientations, decisions, tempo, etc. In other words, you want to compress the time over which you can realize those things. Likewise, what you want to do is you want to inhibit your adversary's capacity to adapt to such environment. In other words, cloud or distort his observations, screw up his decisions, etc. Warfare, camouflage, spoofing, deception, other kinds of things. Ambiguity. So you want to compress your time, stretch out his time. And that's the idea. Simultaneously do both. Compress own time and stretch out adversary time to generate a favorable mismatch of time and ability to adapt, to shape, and adapt, and change. Remember, you're not only adapting, but you're shaping. Don't, don't, don't just be a react. Be a shaper, too. So you're trying to compress your time. You're trying to generate that mismatch of time and ability to shape, and adapt, and change. Now, if you can realize that, that idea, then the goal happens almost as a natural consequence. If you realize that, you're going to get this goal almost as a natural consequence. Call it. You'll start to clash his system with confusion disorder, cause him to over and under react and do crazy kinds of things. Because you not only appear menacing, because there's something about it there, but also ambiguous, chaotic, misleading, etc. Okay. Competition, adversary relations. This is more than just war. War, you know, it's not the body count. That's it's pretty narrow. It's more than body count. That's why we got screwed up in Vietnam, where it's only about body count. So this is a much more general definition. Apply to war, apply to very soft kinds of things, or in intermediate things. Any kind of competitive behavior, whatever it might be. And you see it works on somebody's what? Mind. Right. I'll make some statements later on. Very important. Okay? This next chart I'll skip just an example you want to. And those are sort of the ideas or notions I had in my mind before I dove into my historical investigation. And remember the reason why I wanted to get into that because the book is that I sort of see what's happening here in terms of the results. But what were those internal dynamics? Well, as I got into that, I found out in order to understand Bushwick, I had to read military history. I read military history. The reason why I did that because Guderian and the others would help shape the Bushwick would refer to an earlier year of military history to have a one-liner. Well, I don't know what it meant. I mean, I knew what the words said, but I didn't know the, the context. So I had to go back and read it. Then when I learned the context, I was, okay, I got that, and I had to learn others pretty soon. As I'm going through it, I, can't, I just can't talk about Bushwick. I look at guerrilla warfare, regular warfare, dirty tricks, all kinds of stuff. War in general, or competition in general. And then it became very evident to me when you look at that. A statement I'm going to make now, I almost made it a few minutes ago. A statement I'm going to make now, you're going to see I'm going to say, say it more than once as I go through this presentation. But we still, in some ways, don't understand it. Remember, terrain doesn't wage wars. Machines don't wage wars. People do when they use their mind. So if I go after the terrain or the machine, I'm going to have to try it over and over again. But if I go after somebody's mind, then I got the people, and I got the machines, and I got the terrain. And how important is that in place? That's the idea. That and all forms of conflict, different subtle, subtly different nuances. Very important. I'm going to say it one more time before you do it. Terrain doesn't wage wars, machines don't wage wars, people are going to use their mind. And I can show you our careerism, in a sense, is related to terrain later on. There's no different kind of terrain. Think about it. It causes problems. We'll get into that later. So if that's the case, then what are we really referring to here? In some way or another, we're talking about human behavior or human, human nature. After all, he's the one to <laughs> So maybe that should be our starting point. So let's go back to the And we're going to 
we're going to get right down to the very simple fundamentals. To start this anyway. First of all, I think we want to survive, otherwise, we die like Or as a group, we want to survive. Not only that, you want to survive, you tend to want to survive in your own terms. In other words, you don't want to have you don't want to have to survive under owner's circumstances. You want to have some control over your survival, some freedom of action. Well, if you begin to think about that, in some sense, you want to improve your capacity for independent action. Whether you're talking about individuals, groups, nation states, or what have you, or political parties. But it turns out we live in a world of limited resources, not only in terms of physical, skill, talents, the whole nine yards. So, if we improve our capacity for independent action, and there's limited resources, we're going to tend to deprive somebody of their capacity for independent action. Or if we improve our our ability to survive our own terms, we tend to deny him. Or if we really get sharp, we can make it impossible for him to survive at all. You people don't have this. You don't have to worry about survival. You're <laughs> off We're not going to talk physical. We're talking about anything that matters. <coughs> So the implication is quite clear. Life is conflict, survival, and conflict. Period. You can be soft, you can be intermediate, you can be sharp. That's the way it is. Remember, World War I was a war that ends all wars. That didn't work out too good. World War II, we'll make the world a preserved world for democracy. That hasn't gone. And I go on and on. And you people don't have to compete for your particular job anyways. Because you give it to free, free lunch. Always. We not only have conflict, we have survival and conquest in many different modes and norms. That's what. So, that being the case, it leads me to this comment. If that's the case, we're not only talking about conduct of war, but we can also bring other ideas in, like the theory of natural selection. The creationists might not like that too well, but. One of the interesting things about the theory of natural selection, some of it's under challenge, not all of them, some of it's up, is because whether you're talking about war or these ideas of evolution, they impinge very much upon this idea of, of conflict, struggle, coping, adapting, effect. And many different views are part of that. We want to look at those. Remember, I said we don't want an elegant solution or a definitive solution. We want to look at If our adversary has done elegance, we know his plus some other ones that we have never compared. I'll bring that on a different ways to get through it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to accept your adversary's viewpoint. You better understand it. We like the mirror image. You know, we've got it right to hell with us. We can take them out. We'll get trouble. You have to understand it. I'll make that evident to you. Okay, so that's why I want to look through these things. And what happens when we do that? I'm going to give you an overall, what I call an overall initial impression here. We'll go right back to corner to you see. Initial impression I got out of after a few years look. Pretty soon things start kicking off in my head because I'm looking at a lot of data, looking at many different forms. And this is the impression I was left with. I'll let you read it and I'll comment on it. Can you all read that all right? Okay, let me talk. You know what I'm referring to in this first couple of things? Variety and rapidity. To give you a feel for what I'm referring to, why variety and rapidity is important, let's turn the argument around and say we don't have variety and we can't operate by What does that mean? That means you lose your ability to adapt, you also become predictable. In conflict, you want to have adaptability and unpredictability. You have no choice. If you become predictable and not adaptable, you lose your adversary and get away from it. That's why it's important. That's why those so called alligators and their solutions fall in trouble. Not only that, you have to learn how to work with other people. So you can work as a concerted whole. You have to be able to harmonize your activity or cooperate. If you don't, you can't work together. Everybody has ultimate freedom of action. Then you've got a mob. There's everything going on in all directions. You can't work. You can't function. 
So there has to be some kind of things you invoke in order to permit people to focus and bring about that message. We've got to harmonize our activity to get into that deeper. And then finally, even if you can operate rapidly with the rise of harmonize our activity, you just can't sit there and let the world take care of you. Well, you have to take initiative. In other words, you want to be a shaper or you want to be a reactor. You have to take initiative. And this sort of military status screwed up over now. They don't they understand this. They get it confused with offensive and defense. If I can take initiative whether I'm on the offense or defense or wherever I am, those are incorrect terms. Initiative, whether you're moving forward, backwards, sideways, or any direction. As long as you are using the, lever, uh, the initiative, then you can get that lever. We'll make that evidence for you. So what I'm really saying, these are very important qualities. And later on, what we'll do, we'll only bring those out, we'll show you how they tie together. We mesh them right together with the so-called Uru. How they play together. That would be to work our way Okay, with that in mind now, let's step back to the earliest known treatise on war. Sun Tzu, the art of war. How many people read it? Anybody here? The Art of War. You get some arguments when it was written. Some say 500 BC, some say 300. <laughs> I added them together, divided by two, and bureaucratically averages came out around four. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who you are. That's what we call bureaucratic averages. <laughs> two poles, say fine. Adam did it, divided by two, we got it right where we want it. Each guy's got a piece of the action. Okay, in any case, we look at Sun Tzu's Art of War. Here's the theme that begins to unfold. Note that first bullet, harmony. Those people who read it will recall in this very first chapter, what's he talking about? How does citizens have to be in accord with the rulers of the estate? They have to be able to be in accord or harmonize with the rulers of the state. They have to harmonize with one another and also the rulers of the state. Without that, the state can't go to war. It's the most important thing. Same thing in political parties. What you want to do is get this harmony in the opposite party so you can realize the level. So the very first thing you've got to get is get harmony in your operation. Get people to work together so you can get that leverage. But Sun Tzu understood that back in BC. That's very Another thing that literally drips throughout the treatise, war to act, the idea of deception. And more than once he makes the statement, all war is based upon deception. But other kinds of conflict aren't. All wars based upon the Another notion he brings up, the idea of being quick, speedy, or swift, what I call swiftness of action. He said the essence of war is rapidity, swiftness, etc. Also states that more than one. Then he brings in a notion in a very indirect way, which I call fluidity of action, which he brings out in a very metaphorical way. In fact, that's one thing when you first read Sun Tzu, you're not sure what you read. There's metaphors, aphorisms, and analogies. You say, boy, that was great to tell that read. <laughs> so you pull out something you don't get right away because your Western mind is not tuned to it. And one of those is related to what I call food event. For those people who read it will remember, he made the statement, farming should behave like water going downhill. Go for the weakness, the boys, the fishers, the gaps. Now think about that for a moment. If the army is going to behave like water, and if water does that, what he's really saying, in some sense, you want to impose your strength against your adversary's weakness. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect is, well, we're moving along paths of least resistance. A third aspect, since you're working in the environment, you want to adapt to that environment. That's what water does. So there's three ideas to put in action. Strength against weakness, paths of least resistance, and adaptability. But you people in the political party don't want this. <laughs> Again, you see all this stuff, it all is very, very, very true. Okay, so then you use all these kinds of things. Plan together in order to play what we call the military, the dispersion concentration. Sometimes you want to be dispersed, it'll become evident later on with you. Sometimes you want to be concentrated. But you're shifting from dispersion to concentration back to forth. For what reason? That gives you a way of imposing your strength into your adversary's weakness. You already operate, always operate in one form, you tend to become predictable. If you're changing that form, then you can impose your strength into his weakness. It's a way of doing it. 
And why do you do that when you change these things around? You're playing all these things together to effect, to effect or to generate what we call surprise and shock. No, to effect, surprise and shock. What do I mean here? I don't surprise you. You don't surprise me. We treat it as an input. I do certain things. And if I'm clever about it, you are surprised. It's a reaction. It's an output. Shock is an output. Or you do things very cleverly as an output, then I become surprised or shocked. Yet you look at some of our military manuals, they treat shock and surprise like it's an input. It's not an input, it's an output. I don't surprise you. You really are surprised by my actions. You react to you because you can't cope, can't keep up, don't discern what's going on, or whatever it might be. You really want to sort that out. You might say, well, this is true, but it's really later on. It isn't. Because once you get that sorted out, then it gives you another way for applying leverage to somebody. Because the question becomes, what are these different things you do, or how do you play things together in order to get this reaction we call surprise and shock out of branch? It becomes very important. We still have a moment. We have shock action, not shock action. You do certain things. You place somebody into a state of shock. If they're in a state of shock, they can't cope, they can't adapt, they become paralyzed, they don't know what to do. That's essentially it. So this is sort of his theme. Later on, we'll define this term. Very careful. Right now, we're just gathering the evidence. And here's his strategy related to this thing. Note the first ball. Get inside his organization. No strengths, weaknesses, maneuvers, intentions, etc. How does he do that? Simple. Spines, reconnaissance, pride, every dirty trick we know today he knew back then. Matter of fact, you read his chapter on, on spy, he talked about double agents. Oh, that's there. That's all. <coughs> all those times. In other words, you're trying to do what? Understand, know your adversary. Remember his famous statement? Know your enemy, know yourself, win 100 battles. Well, one of the ways to help knowing your enemy is through this intelligence, reconnaissance, and all these kinds of things, to get inside his mind. You don't be And remember, in a much deeper sense, 